I had an auntie with MS and she can not move. She's in a quadriplegic unit. Um, she can speak and she can swallow, but that's it. And so for me, that was like, that's what was going to happen. And I just wanted to do wow. everything I could possibly do. To I imagine that. you were more terrified than most in that case. Rebecca Stonor was struggling with a severe lack of energy, memory problems and neurological issues. She put it down to being a tired mum, but when she suddenly started losing her eyesight too, she went to see the doctor. She was told that she had multiple sclerosis, would be on meds for the rest of her life and that there was nothing she could do about it. Not willing to settle for the same fate as her aunt, Rebecca, with her science background, scoured the research papers. What she discovered set her on a totally different trajectory and five years on, she is both symptom and medication free. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Your story is super inspiring and I'm sure this interview would be, will be of great benefit to many. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. Nice to meet you. You're very welcome. Um, how long ago did you receive your MS diagnosis and what were the symptoms? Yeah, so it was nearly six years ago, uh, six years in August. Um, so my first main symptom that I guess led to the diagnosis was vision problems. I lost almost all eyesight in one of my eyes. Colour vision went. Um, I was feeling pretty awful, but I had a small child at the time. I think he was about two. And so I just put it down to, you know, sleep deprivation and running around after him. And I just thought I wasn't looking after myself. I was eating a terrible diet. Um, and but then this vision thing happened and I thought I'd better go and have this checked out. So in the course of, you know, trying to get in to see specialists, going to emergency at hospital, all these different things I did to try and work out what was going on. I kind of did the Dr. Google and Googled it. And, um, you know, I found this web page. It was actually an Australian web page that talked about, OK, you've got um, these symptoms with your vision. Have you got this or this or this? And it sort of led through a decision tree uh, and it came out with it looks like you have uh, the one of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. It's very, very common, it's called optic neuritis. Um, so yeah, that kind of really freaked me out. And then I finally had somebody send me along to MRI. And so it showed that I had multiple lesions in my brain. Um, they, they're like scar tissue. So MS is an autoimmune disease um, where your body attacks your, your brain and your spinal cord, so your central nervous system. So yeah, I was petrified and having two small children Unless you've been diagnosed with something, you know, it's really hard to describe that feeling. Like it's just yeah. earth shattering. I, I can't imagine, but yeah, that's that's got to be so terrifying. My, my heart goes out to anyone. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, what kind of um, prognosis were you given? Uh, they can't, they couldn't predict it. So nobody can give you um, much of an idea except for the statistics. So the statistics with MS is usually within... 10 years you'll have maybe a relapse every year. So a relapse is a whole lot of symptoms come on. Um, you can have a steroids, steroid treatment to sort of suppress those. But um, so, yeah, you get a relapse every year or so, maybe two a year, depending on your severity. In 10 years, there's some disability. Um, so my experience with MS, like in terms of family and friends, is I had an auntie with MS and um, she progressed really quickly. She was diagnosed in her 30s. Uh, it was in a wheelchair very quickly, but this was, you know, maybe 40 years ago or something. So there wasn't much in terms of intervention. Mm -hmm. um, she now is still alive, but she can not move. She's in a quadriplegic unit. Um, she can speak and she can swallow, but that's it. Um, and so for me, that was like that's what was going to happen and I just wanted to do wow. everything I could possibly do. To I imagine that. you were more terrified than most in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah it wasn't a good outlook for me. Um, I didn't know anybody who was doing well. So, yeah, it was really, really scary. So what kind of um, treatment were you prescribed? So I started, you know, the neurologist who I saw um, gave me some options of medication so I started on one, it was horrible, I lost half my hair, um, all sorts of gastro upsets, um, I just felt awful. Um, and I've actually, the recent appointment I had with my neurologist, she said she would have never prescribed that. Um, I was of childbearing age, not that I wanted any more kids, but if I had children, 
um, it was a mutagen, so they would have ended up with birth defects. So, yeah, great. Wow. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, neurologist. Didn't <laughs> really, I mean, look, I could have done the reading, but I was completely overwhelmed. And he said, this is the best bet for you. So then I went on a second one, um, didn't really have any side effects. It was okay, but there was a possibility of having um, a something go wrong and basically die and without notice. And so it was just a little bit, you know, and, and of course I was scared. I thought I've got to try something. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, I eventually went off of that. So I started following a program called Overcoming MS um, developed by a medical doctor in Australia who had MS himself. Um, and that was a whole food plant-based diet, incorporated a bit of seafood, which I was having at the time, um, but a whole lot of other um, lifestyle factors as well. So, okay. yeah, I, I did both things. I pretty much changed my diet overnight, even before I was in the neurologist's office and they said, it looks like you have MS. And then, um, yeah, did medication at the same time. Did any, like, mainstream um, doctors or healthcare professionals prescribe any kind of nutritional intervention or no? No. I went along um, because I was a little bit worried, you know, like I'm cutting out all these major food groups you know, I thought I needed dairy for strong bones and red meat for iron and all that sort of stuff. And so I went along to a dietitian that they recommended, the MS Society in South Australia, and she oh, I was terrible. Um, she had a wall of packaged goods. So there's like Nutrigrain and all these breakfast cereals and then there was like little packets of yogurt and things like that. And she said, you can just eat a wide variety of these foods. There wasn't even like a bowl of apples or something in her de in her office. And and you know, and then she said, because she has to talk about the healthy eating guidelines, which are, you know, in Australia they're a little bit outdated. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, she was very worried about me changing my diet as well. And I kind of left and never went back to her. Yeah, yeah, good for you. Um, so eventually you got onto a completely whole foods plant-based diet, didn't you? How did you find out about that? Started just doing more reading. So my background is in science. So I worked as a scientist for nearly 20 years. Um, and so I could read the scientific articles and I sort of just delved into them and I just came across the documentaries, you know, Forks Over Knives and all that sort of stuff and got into all the big um, nutritionists mostly in the US and just read all their stuff, I read lots of books. And I just thought, oh, maybe I don't need that seafood. I didn't really like it very much. Mm -hmm. And so I can get my omega-3s and my protein from other things. Why am I eating this? Um, and we actually had um, a couple of pet guinea pigs at the time too and <laughs> They, you know, they were funny. They they were they would come and they would come up to the edge of the cage and they would squeak at me, and I'd look inside and they had clean bedding, they had water and food, but they just wanted to talk to me. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> this little animal, this big, you know, wants to talk to me. And so I kind of went like I went through the whole, you know, you do this, you you, you look at it from a health perspective, and then I just suddenly thought, oh, hang on, mm. they're animals too, and I'm eating animals, and yeah, made that yeah. connection very quickly. Very good. Um, yeah. And so is it specifically a lower fat, whole foods plant-based diet that you now follow? Yeah, so it's it's a low saturated fat diet. So there's okay. a yeah, strong evidence that saturated fat, um, like a lot of chronic disease, um, plays a role in um, the demyelination of the brain. So, okay. yeah, saturated fat wasn't good. So taking all of that out of my diet. I mean, I have, you know, everything has a little bit of fat in it and a little bit yes. of saturated fat. So I do have like, you know, a fair bit of linseeds and chia seeds and things like yeah. that. A little bit of avocado and walnuts and stuff from time to time, but really trying to keep saturated fat under 10 grams a day. Okay. Um, so yeah. what's that about five tablespoons of nuts and seeds max? Oh yeah. Even less than that. Even less. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, yeah, eat lots and lots of calories, but yeah, not from yeah, that. So it's not low fat. Yeah, I think it's just low saturated fat. And when I you take that, animal products out, then, you know, it's pretty yeah. much gone. I think that makes sense because we wouldn't be able to get lots of nuts and seeds naturally. Like it wouldn't be an easily attainable thing, would it? The amount of work, you know, to... To do it. versus you've got you know like loads of, if we evolved in the tropics we've got all these lovely tropical fruits that smell delicious and make us salivate we can dig up tubers and things and we learn to cook so that that makes sense to me yeah. and, um, and even um, even coconut i i don't mm. eat any coconut products coconut water is okay because it doesn't yeah. make fat, but 
I'll avoid all coconut Same. milk or whatever. And um, the people often ask me, oh, well, you know, can't I have a little bit of coconut milk in my curry? And I'm like, yeah, sure. If you can get the coconut, like, firstly, off the tree and you can mm. strip the husk off and you can smash it open and you can, like, pulverise the flesh to make coconut milk, go for it. Yeah. But by the time you've done that, you've burnt off, like, 2,000 calories anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do we know the mechanism by which saturates damage the, the myelin sheath? I've not heard about that before. Um, I think it's more about um, keeping cell membranes pliable. So when you've got a saturated fat, it's making them sticky. They're not doing, you know, what they should normally do. Okay. Um, and whereas you've got lots of omega-3, so omega-3 is very anti-inflammatory, as you probably know. So mm -hmm. having a lot of that is dampening down the inflammation, but it's also making those cell membranes very pliable. Right. Um, there's also something about saturated fats and the immune response our body has. Um, and so that would then stimulate the autoimmunity and right. you know, promote that sort of stuff. Um, the other thing about dairy is it's got um, proteins in it that mimic the myelin in the brain. Right. So, yeah, it's like molecular mimicry, it's called. So your, your immune system will have this response and it goes, oh, there's a foreign protein. Maybe I need to attack that. Wow. And it happens to be the central nervous system. So... There is some science to suggest perhaps that might be what causes type 1 diabetes. Is there, I, I believe, yeah. I heard so it's a similar mechanism. <laughs> That's very process. interesting. I've not heard that before. Thank you. Um, yeah. How soon after your um, diet change did you see a, a mitigation in your symptoms? Yeah, so I was diagnosed with something called relapse remitting MS. So you have a relapse, it tends to go away. And then you have another one. So it sort of goes like that. And over the course of years, then it accumulates and you can um, end up disabled. But so my symptoms went away um, probably within the first six months. And I didn't have any steroid treatment. So basically I was diagnosed too late to have any steroid treatment. So my vision um, was great um, probably within six months. And all the other symptoms I had, I had a whole lot of like, cognitive problems, um, fingers wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. I mean, I could get along and do my everyday tasks. I was still working, still exercising, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I felt pretty rubbish. But I think within six months of changing my diet, I felt really good. Wow. Um, and since then I've been, yeah, living really well and I still don't have any symptoms. So. Symptom-free? Yeah, yep. Nice. And, yeah. um, you, sorry, I can't remember. Did you say that you, they put you on meds initially? Yeah, so I stayed on those for maybe the first 12 months, something like that, and then I weaned off yeah. and I just, um, I wanted, there was so much evidence. There was so much evidence um, and it's only, you know, a growing body of evidence as well that diet and MS are related. So, wow. um, yeah, I wanted to give my body a chance. Yeah, and so you're medication free now? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. But, yeah, I know. It's great. Um, but the thing about the Overcoming MS program is that you do whatever it takes to stay well. So there's a seven-step program. Nutrition is definitely at the top. Um, exercise, sleep, vitamin D supplementation. Vitamin D is very important for people with MS. Okay. Um, preventing it in your family members as well. So that's something I do for my kids. Um, but it's also medication if needed. So if I go along... And I have uh, MRIs quite regularly. And if there's a significant change between my MRIs, I will definitely look into medication um, yeah. because there are so many on the market now. I think there's like 17 in Australia anyway, 17 oh. medications. So, you know, and they're not as severe as the other ones I was on. So yeah. I wouldn't rule it out in the future. And I don't ever yeah. want to say to people, don't take medication. Yeah. Because so they're more there as a backup. And if you, if you can get rid of the symptoms with just the healthy... I suppose because I guess there may be the like the possibility of side effects. So I guess you don't want to do it unless you have to. But you're saying like you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't advocate not using them if, if your symptoms come back. Yeah, definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. Because, yeah, that, um, that makes sense to me. Everybody's MS is different too. You know, um, some people. I've got a friend who her first symptom of her diagnosis was she couldn't get out of bed. Her legs wouldn't move, and she had three little children at the time, and it was just. You know what what worse could you have you know so yeah. um look you know and if somebody's ms is particularly aggressive which it happens to be in a lot of men if they get ms right. just opt for whatever you can but you do everything else with it all the dietary all the stress reduction yeah. all of that sort of stuff as well yeah that makes it i think what i'm hearing from you is this kind of risk reward type thing yeah 
Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. What do you, any mainstream health professionals that you still deal with make of your recovery? I expect they'd be asking you for tips. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, um, <laughs> I'm, they're worried about me. So I'm a, my neurologist is quite worried about me. Um, one of them said that, you know, there can be things going on in the background and you can't quite see it because it's small in the MRI, but, you know, uh, they call it subclinical inflammation. Um, and... Yeah, they're worried. Um, they're not pushing the drugs on me because, um, you know, I said this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But none of them have supported what I'm doing. Wow. Um, I've got a great GP who's excellent, like a general doctor. Um, she's excellent. But specialists, no, no, nobody has ever supported what I do. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but they see some awful, awful things come through their rooms. Yeah, yeah all yeah, sorts of sure. awful things. I hope they soon start to catch up. <laughs> Bless. Um, so um, is there any diet, is there, sorry, is there any data on how many people with MS um, have the MS go into remission when they adopt a whole foods plant-based diet? I don't know. Um, the person who developed this um, overcoming MS protocol did a, and I think he's still doing it, gathering lots of data from all different, you know, people with MS just to see how they're going. Um, there is some evidence that uh, they have better uh, or less depression. So that's one of the things a lot of people with MS have. It can be a symptom, obviously, how they feel, but it can be the way their brain is affected as well. Yeah. Um, better quality of life. Back in, um, I think it was the 1950s to the 70s, there was somebody called Roy Swank who did a body of work on nearly 150 people, um, half of them, adhered to his low fat diet he did have some low fat chicken breast and milk and stuff in it but he um he followed the people so basically the people who were very low saturated fat and eating that sort of a diet did exceptionally well and by the end of the study they were all fit and able and you know still walking around the other poor dieters who just had a little bit and that's a thing that's a real key thing they just had a little bit more saturated fat in their diets did really poorly 80% of them by the end of the study were dead um, and those who were still alive, yeah, were disabled and not having a great time. So, right. you know, it, and, and I see it often because I'm in a lot of MS groups, those having just that little bit more, little, you know, the cheat days, um, that's when stuff starts going wrong. So yeah. so it's pretty obvious that it's really the, the saturates are a big... Yeah, yeah. And there's been global studies, like some areas that eat, you know, high dairy compared to... Um, you know, MS was pretty much non-existent in a lot of Asian countries. Right. Um, and during the war as well, when people rationed and they were eating cabbages and potatoes and stuff, hardly any um, hospitalizations due to MS. Right. So, yeah. 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 It's all Lots there. It? It's all there. Yeah. Um, what does a typical day of eating look like for you nowadays then? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> people probably think I'm a bit strange, but my <laughs> breakfast is usually... Um, I usually have some sort of berries, always berries, every day. I want those high antioxidant kind of foods and a source of carbohydrate because I don't like being hungry. Um, so I'll have like sweet potato mixed with my berries and some ground flaxseed or something on. Um, I make a homemade soy yogurt, which is amazing. So maybe a dollop of that as well. But yeah, always berries. Sometimes maybe some brown rice instead of sweet potato. I've just got into taro. I don't know if you've had taro. If you have it, but that's a grain, isn't it? No, it's a it's like oh, a big it's, like a potato um, it's a root vegetable, well like a big starchy root, and it's really kind of like hairy and ugly on the outside. But right. seriously, when you steam it, um, it just becomes this really you know, I think your taste buds change. So really simple things like this are just delicious. To me, it tastes like cream cake or something. So it's wow. slight sweetness and it's got this like real creamy. I had to look it up um, just to see if it had a fat content because to me it has that mouthfeel anyway yes. don't get me started about i've made a farrow. note i'm going to give that a try i think i confused it with farrow just now <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, i think that's taro. where i went wrong but that's taro t-a-r-o yeah. yep yep so if you can get your tropical fruits and stuff delivered i wonder if you can get yeah taro. i shall ask asian michael <laughs> asian supermarkets here have it so that's where i find it right um so yeah then uh, a lunch type thing um Big salads all the time, big salads. Um, but a salad to me is not just leafy greens. I try and have heaps of leafy greens, but I'll throw in chickpeas and, you know, brown rice and 
um, whatever I've got going. You know, it's funny when I go to my workplace, I have a huge salad bowl, like a big bowl that you would normally be a serving dish, and that's my salad. So I'm pouring it in. It's got all the rainbow colours and everything, and um, quite often gets a lot of comments in the tea room. And then dinner, dinner is um, something that we can eat as a family. So my my partner and my kids, we all eat the same way. Um, definitely all plant based. And at home, definitely whole food plant based. And we don't have oils, added oils as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll just cook up a big curry or, you know, something that will try and please the kids and me at the same yes. time. I love yeah. it. Sounds great. I'm salivating. Um, <laughs> how, difficult, how difficult did you find the, the transition in diet? Um, well, the fear was a massive motivator. Um, the fear of being disabled, but also I think I just had to learn how to cook a little bit differently. So from, you know, instead of splashing a heap of oil in a pan and frying onions, um, I had to sort of think a little bit more, you know, about how I do that process um, and also going out to eat mm. and asking them to prepare food in a certain way for me. At first I was really embarrassed about that, but now, you know, I realise they don't care what I eat. They just want to make a sale, right? So they, they just, just want to money, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So they don't care how weird I am with my food preferences. Um, and then sort of getting away from anything deep fried as well. So, you know, I mean, before before I changed my diet, I pretty much ate a standard diet. Um, but now looking back, it's like, yeah, it wasn't particularly, well, obviously didn't do many favours. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I saw that you have a certificate now in plant-based nutrition through e Cornell. Suffering as you did, and then finding salvation through you know this nutrition. Did, is that what inspired you to to help others? Um, yeah, yeah. I think I just I just when you get this information, um, I find almost like I've got a responsibility to share it. Mm. Um, I can't hold it to myself. If there's somebody next to me, you know, like it just took one person, one comment on a Facebook post. Somebody said to me, have you heard of overcoming MS? When I was in that desperate time and I was searching and searching the internet, um, I thought, no, I haven't heard that particular one, but let me look it up. And that's what made me change, like, overnight. So if I can just make that, and I do it occasionally, I go into different MS groups and I'll say, have you heard of overcoming MS? Nice. Um, you know, just to sort of get the information out there. Um, but, yeah, I can't, I can't be quiet about it because no. it might help. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's beautiful. Uh, so tell us about your advocacy. Obviously, you've got your Instagram page and website, which I'll link below. Um, you also do cooking demos and courses, and you write for several other on online platforms as well. Is that right? Yeah, so I write for um, She Sapiens. It's a, um, a platform that um, is sort of aimed at women, empowering women with knowledge across the world. So I'm their plant-based nutrition expert. Um, I've just been providing them with a few recipes lately too. So a lot of articles about um, plant-based nutrition and how to choose the right foods and, you know, uh, things like um, uh, meat substitutes actually good for you, all that sort of stuff. So it's sort of really practical advice. And now I've got a few recipes up there. Um, yeah, I do, I do cooking classes in person and um, virtual cooking classes as well. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I've had a few where um, we're cooking along together. Um, yeah. it's, it's, I've had a few where I did one with Chef AJ recently. Oh, where, wow. Um, she's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's excellent. So everybody was watching me. Um, it was just like a, a chat and a demo. But then I've had it where people are cooking along. So I'll send them a list of ingredients. They'll have it all prepped, all chopped and ready to go. And then um, we just cook together and then have chats in between and stuff. So that's been If really people want to get involved in that, is that through your, your website? Yeah, yep, yeah. definitely got all my contact details on my website. So, yeah, website is justeatplants.com.au. Um, yeah. I've also started doing wellbeing programs. So in a workplace, the, um, I've done workshops and cooking demonstrations and stuff like that in a workplace setting. So um, I had somebody contact me saying, I'd really like this information to, you know, come into our workplace. And um, so, yeah, I try and present in a way that's not threatening. Um, you know, I tell my story, but it's also practical that they can implement the changes themselves if they want to yeah i bet you're like me like just being able to share all this info i bet it brings you like a lot of joy and sort of a sense of you know you, if you're doing good in the world it's a nice feeling isn't it i think it's important to our health yeah yeah sense of yeah. purpose um definitely and you know i'll sometimes prepare a meal for somebody or do a cooking class with them 
And I've often like left them, they've had their family come home, the kids are home from school or the husband's home from work, and I leave them with a big, uh, basically a feast on their table and I do the dishes and then I go. But I figure that's one meal that's anti-inflammatory for them. Yes. One meal, they might pick up a few things they, you know, may not adopt at all, but I also think it's one meal for the animals. Yes. Um, yeah, one meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every little bit, every little bit counts. And yes. the thing I've noticed, and you've probably noticed too, that people can watch your Instagram posts or Facebook or whatever. They don't like or comment, but they're there yes. and they're listening. So. Yeah. I think that's really important have you ever had any messages from people having like little success stories and thanking you yeah yeah um yeah lots of messages especially after the chef aj one lots of people um i guess people wanting advice people are mm. like scared and desperate and unfortunately the thing i always say to people is that it's better to prevent than reverse a chronic mm. illness but unfortunately it takes that fear motivation you know like to to make the change so um yeah, I've had lots and lots of messages, which is really nice. And, um, for example, my next-door neighbour hadn't been diagnosed with anything, but she came across my podcast, um, one I did a few years ago, and she said, that's my next-door neighbour. If she can do it, I can do it too. Oh, so she wow. went completely whole food plant-based, lost <laughs> heaps of weight, and now her husband is 99% on board as well. So, wow. you know, you don't know. It's the ripple effect, isn't it? Yeah, it's, exactly. It's like, it's beautiful. You know, we'll we'll touch a few people. Those few people will then touch a few people each, and it's exponential, isn't it? And yeah. what a time to be alive when we can have this effect in the world, you know? I know. I know. It's yeah. excellent. Good for you. Um, so I'll imagine, you know, like we chat, will have inspired a fair few people to give a whole food plant-based diet um, a try, thanks to this interview. Uh, many will likely feel overwhelmed by such a seemingly big paradigm shift. What, what tips would you perhaps offer them? Um, they don't have to do it overnight. Many people make small changes. Um, I know that dairy is really hard to give up because it has that, you know, addictive quality, mm. but just small changes and just going towards that, you know, every little bit, if it's just, um, you know, the people start with one meal a week, I would prefer one meal a day, yes. um, just trying out those things, but also educating themselves too. Like um, I didn't listen to my neurologist uh, I asked him, my first appointment, I said, what can I do? Is there anything else I can do to help me? And he said, well, you know, in terms of dietary changes, and he said, it won't it won't hurt you, but it won't help you. And so it was really not great advice. No. And we all know that doctors don't get any nutritional education anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's just, just one step at a time. Just and educate, read everything you can. And um, the thing that I found, though, is that there's a lot of misinformation and you probably get that mm. too, like people are doing paleo and keto and all that kind of stuff and um, trying to go back to the original source and finding information. Yeah. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover today that you'd like to touch on before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. Um, I think you might have just seen my recent post. Um, my daughter gave me a challenge. She said, Mum, because it's getting colder here in Australia, we're heading into winter. For you, it's probably going to be easy. Well, she sent me a challenge. She does this occasion. She says, Mum, every day I want to eat a salad. Every wow. day. Okay, all right. And then so we, we came up with a bit of an idea. Okay, we're going to do it. We call it salad every day in May. Nice. And um, <laughs> it can be a, a fruit salad for breakfast or, you know, big salad for lunch and that kind of stuff. The only prerequisites were has to have a leafy green mm -hmm. and um, an oil-free dressing. And it doesn't have to be every meal, just one a day. One a day. I'm going to join you. I think, I think I'd probably do it anyway. I think I'd probably yeah, no. do it one meal. <laughs> me too, me too. But I'll the challenge is to make, make it look pretty so that we can take a photo of it as well. Exactly. How old is your daughter? You've raised a good one there. She sounds amazing. Yeah. She's 13. Yeah. Um, so she wow. remembers what it was like to eat sausage rolls and, you know, ham and all that sort of stuff. She doesn't miss it. She'd never go back to it. Yeah. Um, my son's eight. He's a bit of an um, advocate too. He goes to school and he wow. said to all his friends, I'm going to live longer than you because I don't eat all that stuff. You know, <laughs> do you know that causes oh, yeah. heart disease? And, you know, he's oh. a little bit, he's a little bit um, I guess, less inhibited. Um, so he just, yeah, he just tells it like it is, which is really great. But I, I actually asked them, I asked them recently if, you know, one day when they move out of home and they have their own money, um, will they go 
and just buy a pizza, like a, a meat lover's pizza, you know, with the whole, all the horrible stuff. And they were just horrified. They're like, oh, yuck, no way. Mm. They might find a vegan version of that and have it, <laughs> but they're not going to have the meat. So it was like, okay, oh, that's good. That's I've really done my job. You've done an amazing job. Fantastic. And um, as I said, I'll link, I'll link your Eat Plants, uh, Just Eat Plants Instagram page and website below. Are you active on any other socials? If anyone would like to get in touch, where's the, the best place to do that? Um, getting in touch through Facebook or Instagram is fine. So I've got your yeah, email details on my website as well. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't tend to do much on LinkedIn, but I'm there. Um, but yeah, I think that's enough because seriously, you can spend... Yeah, we spend every day. Yeah, that's the trouble. We need we need a crew of people to do all the. We just make the content. We need four or five people posting it all out for us. That's the dream, anyway. It, it'll happen yeah. sooner or later if we just believe Rebecca. <laughs> so let's manifest it. Yeah. Yeah, you know it, Rebecca. Thanks again for taking the time to be with me today, and on behalf of the people, the planet, and the animals, thank you so much for all the good you're doing in the world. Yeah, and thank you too. You've got some amazing content out there. So every little bit we do has to help, right? You know it. You know it. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you.